But yeah, firstly, uh, thank you very much for coming along and, and those of you um, joining online for doing so. Uh, in the first talk that I'm going to be giving here, we'll be looking at an update to the UWA Gaston and Hydrate extension that we've been working on over the last uh, year or so. And we'll give some examples um, that have come out of the new bits and pieces of code uh, looking at the concept of cold flow. So <clears throat> to start with uh, the conclusions of the talk, as I said, we've made an update to the code. Um, primarily, this looks at two things. So firstly, uh, improving the film growth mechanics and then looking at uh, different um, I guess surface forces in terms of adhesion of hydrate particles contacting the wall. To give an example of this, we've got a 50 kilometer long pipeline which is experience, uh, experiencing cold flow and we'll see um, what the impact of film growth is over the period of several days in terms of both uh, pressure drops that we can observe and then the resultant impact on flow rates and potentially also one way of, uh, of managing that. And then for the last few slides of the talk, we'll just go through some of the, I guess, upcoming bits and pieces that are going to go into the extension over the next uh, year or so. So firstly, um, to state the obvious, simulation tools need to be informed by data. Now, in terms of where the hydrate extension came from, that data was largely about uh, benchtop apparatus and intermediate scale apparatus. We can see the uh, Hytra and high jump flow loops down here and their new home over at Oilfield Technologies. So when we first built the extension, um, it was these bench top and these intermediate scale pieces of experimental data, which, which told us that every little bit uh, of the, the mechanics was being implemented correctly. But what we've been able to do more recently, and in particular, uh, our collaborative effort with Wood uh, and through Virtuoso, which Dalip will be talking to you about a little bit later on, is to start looking at taking a holistic view of uh, validation by looking at field data and finding out what is the extension able to predict, um, where are some gaps in it, and we can take that forward with our uh, development process and try and plug those gaps in future. And all of this, I guess, uh, the point is to look at these long subsea tiebacks. And when we say long, we're talking, you know, 50, 100, 200 kilometer long subsea tiebacks, and in particular, managing hydrate formation within these tiebacks. So, um, I guess in basic terms, if we think about our pipeline, uh, and we think about what happens to the water in that pipeline, when it enters the system, it's going to be uh, in free water, which is able to flow due to the residual heat from the wellhead. Once we wind up within our hydrate equilibrium region, our water can do one of two things when it converts to hydrates. Firstly, it can deposit on the walls and we get these uh, slow but steady hydrate deposit buildups. We can see a trace um, of what happens as a function of time. Basically, we get an increase in the, the local uh, shear stress that the um, fluid is applying to that deposit. So this can have a couple of different effects. Firstly, at some point, that deposit is going to fracture and move downstream, and that's not really something um, that we have a handle on uh, at the moment, but it is certainly, I guess, the next big thing to look at in terms of developing the extension. But the second point is that <clears throat> due to this restriction, um, we can see a, an increase in the pressure drop over the pipeline as a whole, and we can then take that increased pressure drop and relate it back to the fundamental mechanics of our flow simulation and look at, for example, a reduction in flow rate. Now, we can do something similar um, with the other hydrate, the stuff which doesn't stick to the wall, which is going to be transported in our slurry phase. So if that happens, then we'll be interested in the figure such as we've got down in the bottom right-hand side here, um, because that hydrate is going to increase the viscosity of that slurry uh, as more and more of it builds up. So again, uh, a more viscous liquid, this is going to be harder to flow. And again, this is a resistance to flow. So these are the two underlying mechanics by which we can look at doing mechanistic plug predictions within the hydrate extension. And these are predictions based on the underlying physics, which tell you when you're going to get a cessation of flow. So how does this all work? Well, um, in essence, we run our extension and not necessarily just in Olga, but also in Virtuoso more recently and potentially uh, in a number of other simulation packages. We run this, um, uh, this extension on every pipeline section within our network. And what we do is a number of relatively straightforward checks. Firstly, uh, we work out, are we inside the hydrate forming region? And if yes, then how fast is our hydrate going to grow? So in working out that hydrate growth, we have a couple of different interfaces on which our hydrate can grow. Uh, firstly, there's the gas water, the bulk stratified interface here. Um, secondly, this this one winds up being uh, important, very important in terms of uh, growth kinetics is the entrained water droplets. This tends to provide a very large surface area for rapid hydrate formation. 
And then we have two other interfaces at the gas wall and the water wall. Um, and we tend to see film growth occurring at these interfaces, which is much slower, but it is the topic of uh, today's update. So we also have to ask the question, well, what happens to any of that hydrate which forms within the gas phase? So these are little hydrate particles which are being carried along in the gas and they can either contact with the wall and if they're moving at just the right speed, then they can attach to the wall and stick there and deposit. Uh, if they're moving too fast, then potentially they'll be stripped away uh, and suspended in the gas phase or they may fall back into the liquid water. And we have a mechanical force balance which was originally devised by Tom Charlton uh, when he built this code. Um, which tells us what's actually going to happen to those entrained particles. Now, the framework in which this is all built, uh, originally Olga, ex Olga Extensibility, and as I said, more recently Virtuoso. Um, this is very nice from our perspective. It makes it much easier to write the code, much easier for you folks to use the code. Um, and most importantly, this final point here, is we're now actually able to directly integrate these flow assurance effects. And so that's what I was talking about in the last slide we can see an increase in the pressure drop due to hydrate formation, and that can actually get us to some useful economic indicator. <clears throat> so a quick uh, update on what it is that we've actually done within the extension. So the first part of this is uh, the way we are predicting film growth. So we have an equation up here. Basically, this is the amount of hydrate which is forming is a function of some mass transport limitation, some gas water interfacial area. And if we're talking about film growth, that's just the circumference of the pipeline, which is in contact. And then the final point is this uh, driving force, which in the case of film growth is a concentration difference. So what we've done is to update the way that we actually deal with this within the extension and implement a fairly complex looking uh, polynomial interpolation uh, across pressure and temperature space for this concentration differential. Now we can see um, what that looks like in the figure here. So this is our concentration differential as a function of pressure. The solid lines here are uh, what you would predict directly from multi-flash, uh, for example, and then the dotted lines are what we get as a result of our lookup. And I guess the important point here is that the dotted lines are always above the solid lines here. So this is a fairly conservative estimate, and we've actually found that um, it really does help improve our predictions of film growth, particularly at very low subcoolers, so very low driving forces, uh, which weren't being picked up correctly previously, and we'll see an example of that later on. Now, the other thing that we've done, in addition to working out um, or improving our predictions of film growth, is looking at how hydrate actually sticks to the wall in terms of understanding um, what it's going to attach to. So it sounds fairly obvious that uh, the adhesion force with which a particle wants to stick to the wall is going to be a function of the surface properties of that wall. And we can see an example of that over on the left-hand side here, we're looking at that adhesion force as a function of how long these things have been in contact for both carbon steel, which is something that Zach me measured some time ago, um, and then uh, a completely different material, which is a thermoplastic composite down here. And the point of this is to note that firstly, um, because of the difference in the material properties, the adhesion force is much lower for our thermoplastic composite, and also it behaves very differently as a function of time. So. Originally, um, within the extension, when we considered uh, particles adhering to the wall, it was very much that particle wall adhesion force based on this sort of data. But if you think about the way hydrate actually grows, initially our film growth is going to give us a very, very thin film of hydrate which forms around the entire exterior of the pipeline. So in fact, what a hydrate particle coming in contact with that wall is actually going to see is going to be more like a thin film of uh, hydrate. So in fact, we'll have um, cohesion between a hydrate particle and a hydrate film. And then as we get a number of these different hydrate particles building up on the interior of the wall surface, uh, we'll wind up having particle-particle um, cohesion existing. So we've implemented these mechanics, and this is something that uh, Rabinovich was looking at back in 2005. Um, and there are a number of fairly nice relations where you can uh, look at the change in that force as a function of, uh, I guess, separation between uh, these different particles, and there winds up being a fairly nice relationship between the particle-particle forces that we can measure and particle plane forces. So this is what's changed in terms of that uh, particle adhesion within the extension. So what effect does that actually have? That's what we're going to take a look at in the next little section. So we're going to be looking at an example of cold flow. Now for those of you that don't know cold flow, uh, this is the idea that you rapidly 
convert all of the water which is in your system into hydrate and that means that there's no water to enable these things to stick together so effectively you get a bunch of very dry particles which can be suspended in a liquid phase and can move through the pipeline but one of the i guess problems which has uh, shown up in various bits of experimental work is film growth can become a problem over the course of days and you see a steady increase in the pressure drop uh, across these systems so the particular example we're going to be looking at, uh, it's a gas condensate. You can see the composition on the left-hand side here, a very large PT phase envelope. Um, it is a model system. So it's an eight inch uninsulated carbon steel line, which is 50 kilometers long. And we are ignoring any of the bathymetry effects in this case so that we can focus specifically on the effect of the film growth. Uh, it is driven by a very low pressure in or pressure drop in this particular case. And the only temperature effects that we're considering are basically a result of uh, GT. So you can see this is our little uh, PT trace of the flow line here, um, inlet, outlet, and we can lay on top of that the hydrate equilibrium curve. And you'll see there's a fairly uh, consistent but relatively um, small driving force for hydrate formation along the entire pipeline. And the question that we're really going to be asking is in this particular system, or in this particular case, what is the effect of film growth going to be in terms of our ability to produce the system. So where would we have been uh, with the 1.0 extension? That's what we're seeing on this particular slide here. We have a number of different um, uh, variables as a function of our line length. So we've got in green is our pressure uh, and you'll see that drops off fairly linearly along the pipeline. And then our other three lines here are volume fractions. So in brown we have our condensate fraction, in black we have our um, total liquid holdup, and in red we have the hydrate fraction. So if we play the video, you'll see, and this, this lasts for about two days of simulated time, uh, you'll see that it is fairly boring, right? You get a little bit of formation to begin with, uh, and then nothing much changes. But from a hydrate's perspective, boring is good, right? It means that nothing catastrophic is going on. Um, and you'll notice that um, <clears throat> in this particular case, you're seeing uh, this relatively constant hydrate fraction along the entire pipeline. And basically what that means is that we have a hydrate which is predicted to be transported within the slurry phase. There is a small amount of film growth, um, but that's largely an artifact of the simulation uh, which occurs um, at the beginning. Now, also the fact that the hydrate fraction is relatively consistent along the pipeline, uh, and the fact that the difference between the um, brown and the black lines is about the same as the red line, tells you that you've got full conversion of hydrate. So this is one of those cold flow type systems, right? You're rapidly converting all of your water to hydrate, um, and then it's flowing along quite happily. So that was version one of the extension. What happens as a result of including the film growth mechanics um, and the changes to adhesion? So that's what we get in this particular case. Now, uh, green is once again pressure drop, black this time is our gas flow rate, and red is our effective pipeline diameter. Now this value over here, this is basically um, no deposition, and as it approaches the bottom axis, that would be a complete occlusion of the pipeline. So this one takes uh, place over the period of 14 days. And what you'll see is that you get this film growth deposit forming near the inlet. And you'll notice then that you get a, an associated decrease in the pressure. So you get basically choking of the flow at the inlet. But this doesn't really come into, I guess, large effect uh, in terms of its effect on the flow rate until you've got about 20 to 30% of um, your uh, pipeline being occluded. So there's a very non-linear relationship between um, that, uh, that restriction and the pressure drop response. Now, the final thing to draw your attention to here is that, well, you know, as we choke off the inlet flow, our pressure drop basically we lose all of our driving force for, for flow, um, and we are actually seeing a hydrate plug occur here, right? Our, our flow rate is going to zero, and this is both true of the gas and of the liquid phase. So this is, um, with the updated mechanics, basically a plug occurring in a cold flow system as a result of film growth. So if we take a look at the summary of what we've seen over the last few slides, firstly, this is the, uh, the hydrate volume fraction now as a function of um, time that we've operated. So the blue line there is our 1.0 extension, which has some initial condition which causes a little bit of uh, film growth and nothing thereafter. The 1.02, which is what we just saw, that we see fairly consistent film growth uh, throughout the entire simulation. It's relatively linear. And the reason for that is that we don't have any entrainment occurring. So if we increase the pressure drop and therefore increase the velocity of the simulation, what we find is a little transition region. So we have relatively 
uh, slow hydrate formation initially. And then once that film layer builds up to the point um, where any particle contacting the wall is likely to see another hydrate particle, which has a higher adhesive force, we see an increase in the rate at which that deposit begins to build up. Now this is for a condensate system, but it winds up being a lot more sensitive if you've got just a pure gas water system. So you can see here, uh, basically a region of film formation to begin with. And then once that's built up sufficiently, you get this entrainment deposition beginning to occur. So obviously that is not a very desirable thing to have happen. Uh, and the question is, what can we do about it? Well, we know a few things from the simulations that we've run thus far. Firstly, we can see a deposit of 20 to 30% build up before we have any substantial effect on our production rates. So we know that we can probably live with a little bit of film growth over a period of time. We also know that if we have a thermodynamic inhibitor and it's allowed to contact that deposit for long enough, then it's going to dissolve that. It's going to dissociate it and potentially wash it out through the system. Um, and so what we can do is to use the extension to make some predictions of the uh, period and the amount of material that has to be put in in terms of this thermodynamic inhibitor. And that's what we can see in this um, figure here. So you have your inhibitor mass fraction in blue and you have your um, diameter in black. So 100% is our nominal diameter and we can see film growth over a period of about a day. And in this particular case, what we've done um, at the end of every day for a period of half an hour, we dump in 20 barrels of MEG and that is sufficient to wash out the entire deposit and we can happily um, operate uh, in that cyclical fashion. So this is interesting in that it's uh, the extension actually allowing us to look at some alternative management strategies. Rather than dosing in MEG all the time, for example, we can live with meth, less MEG or we can deal with, um, uh, we can look at um, intermittent uh, dosing with MEG, for example. And in fact, I think the CEO is going to be talking to you about uh, under-inhibited systems later on, which will be, I guess, another application of uh, this sort of work. So that is what we can do with uh, the 1.02 version of the extension. Uh, let's just quickly look at what is coming up in the future. The first thing I wanted to talk about, and this is work from Lewis Yu, one of the PhD students who's wrapping up with the group now, um, looking at a better understanding of the interfacial area between hydrates uh, or between water and gas to predict hydrate growth rates. So again, this is our, our equation for um, hydrate growth rate, and it's a function importantly, of what this interfacial area is here. So Lewis did a whole pile of experiments in collaboration with our friends over at uh, Colorado School of Mines, and he produced the following plot here, which is basically the interfacial area as a function of uh, the size of bubbles that exist in a water dominant system. Now, what he noticed is that for particles smaller than about 500 micron, you get full coverage, that is um, the bubble rapidly converts to hydrate and that locks in that surface area. But for larger bubbles than that, the, uh, the surfaces experienced shedding. So there was a continual renewal of area for hydrate formation, which actually can potentially lead to um, faster hydrate formation in larger bubbles, which is not an intuitive result. Now, that work will give us an idea of, or a better idea of predicting growth rates for hydrate in water dominant systems. The second part of that equation is understanding what the effect of that is going to be. And this is some work that uh, Shinsuke Sakura, another one of our PhD students has been uh, doing with the hydrate aggregation loop down at Oilfield Technologies. So um, once we have our hydrate slurry, what's that actually going to do in terms of the viscosity of that slurry? That's what we're seeing in this figure here. So all of the black data points are ones that have been measured by Shinsuke. And this is now telling us about the resistance to flow of a bubble um, system due to hydrate formation. So these are some of the key improvements that we're planning on bringing into the um, liquid model for the extension. On the other side of things, we've talked about uh, the concept of entrainment being very important for growth rate deposition and uh, Kong he will also show you some results which suggest it's very important for nucleation as well. Um, unfortunately, most of our entrainment correlations are built from, in, well, are built from data uh, taken from two to four inch pipelines. So how well these scale to large diameter pipelines is sort of an open question. So we've been doing some uh, work in collaboration with folks at uh, Dassault and Xflow using their uh, fundamental physics-based engine to try and get a prediction of what this entrainment rate might actually be. Firstly, it's small scale systems, and then trying to scale it up to these larger pipelines. 
And I stress this is a very preliminary result, but it's an interesting one, so I wanted to show it. What we've got here is our liquid entrainment rate as a function of superficial gas velocity with a couple of correlations that you might recognize. So pan and hand ready is used uh, largely in our extension. Uh, then there's Olga HD. And the red data points here are what has come out of XFLOW. So this is a pure physics engine, no tuning parameters whatsoever. It has just predicted these entrainment rates. So it looks promising. It's in the right ballpark uh, for these small systems. And our hope is that we can take these results, apply them to larger pipelines, um, and that this will give us a better handle on how our entrainment and how our growth work in these uh, large diameter 20, 30 inch gas dominant pipelines. And then the final thing is our ongoing work on uh, nucleation and KHI. So Mark is going to be talking to you about these cells in quite some detail. And of course, we have uh, Professor Tohidi, who's going to be talking about um, KHIs as well. To give you a brief uh, introduction, this is one of our high pressure stirred automated lag time apparatus. So it's this little uh, cell here. We have many of them, 16, 20, 16. All right, we have 16 of these little things sitting in the lab. Um, they can be very rapidly taken in and out of the hydrate forming region. So what that means is that we can get uh, large data sets. And these wind up looking something like this. So you, you can actually work out the probability that hydrate is going to begin forming as a function of the induction time or subcooling, these sorts of very key parameters for our pipeline. Now, because we have such rich data sets, we can wind up actually fitting continuous models to these. And Mark's going to talk a little bit about that. Um, and the, the upshot of all of this is that we can then actually start looking at the probability that we're going to get hydrate formation as we move into the hydrate region. So just because you are a little bit inside the hydrate region doesn't mean you're going to form hydrate. But as you move further and further into it, the probability goes up. So you may be able to live with some limited hydrate formation probability. And that's something that Mark has been uh, looking at in quite some detail over the last year or so. And so he'll give you a, an update and an advancement of uh, the work shown here. So again, the conclusions, um, we have an update to the extension. We are now hopeful that we can start looking at uh, alternative phenomena. Cold flow in particular is an interesting um, strategy with a number of different management options for it. Uh, and we are continuing to develop the extension, in particular with uh, collaboration with uh, the folks over at Wood through Virtuoso. Um, we look forward to showing you more on that in the future. So thank you, everyone.